Good morning, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Taylor here. All right, so today we're going to do a lesson on inferential questions, okay? And we're going to start with our I can statement. So go ahead and echo me. Today, I will learn about inferential questions, all right? I want you to think about the motions I did. I made this motion. What do you think that motion represents? You're right, it represents a book. And then I pointed to my head, and I made a look like this. What do you think that meant? You're right, I'm thinking. So inferential questions take two things, okay? We're gonna talk about those two things in just a moment. We have learned this school year about three different types of questioning. Okay, and I'm going to show you the poster, and I realize there's going to be lots of words on it, but we're going to go every, over everything, okay? So we have types of questions. We have literal, we have inferential, and we have critical, okay? Literal questions are those questions that are in the book. For example, I would say, what color of coat was Little Red Riding Hood wearing in the story? And you would say, red. Inferential is the question that we're going to focus on today, so I'm going to skip down to critical. Okay, when I ask you a critical question about a book, you are going to be taking your own opinion and what you read and justifying it through the book. So, for example, I might ask you, how would you feel if you were Little Red Riding Hood? And you might say, I felt scared. I would have felt scared because the wolf would have been trying to eat my grandmother and myself. So you're taking that, that information from the book, the wolf trying to eat uh, Little Red Riding Hood's grandma, and you're thinking about how Little Red Riding Hood may have felt, and that's how you may have also felt. Inferential questions, I'm going to put the poster down, and I'm going to explain it a little bit deeper before we get started on our story. So I've gone ahead and made this anchor chart here, and it's all about making inferences, okay? And with inferences, you're going to focus on two different things, okay? You're going to focus on the book, okay, the text clues, and then you're going to focus on yourself, your own background knowledge. And background knowledge is just the information you know from your own experiences or maybe books that you've read in the past, okay? So today we're going to focus on a book that some of you are very aware of or have read before. It's one of my favorite books called Ruby Bridges. And we're actually going to start by making an inference before I begin reading the story. I'm going to scoot a little bit closer to you right now. Okay, so you can see the picture. Okay, I want you to look at the people in the background and I want you to look at Ruby. I want you to think about what you think Ruby's doing right now. Look at her face, and then look at the people in the background's face. All right, now that you've had time to think about it, I'm going to share with you an inference that I made. Now, I know I've already read this book, but you can even make inferences when you haven't read a book before. So I see Ruby's face here, and she looks determined. She looks like she has courage on her face. And I look at the people in the background, and they look angry. I also noticed that all the people in the background were white, and Ruby is black. This makes me think that it happened a long time ago. So it didn't happen yesterday. It happened during the segregation period. I also could make an inference because I'm looking at Ruby's clothes and I'm thinking about what kind of clothes you guys wear to school. Does it look similar or different and why? This also makes me think that this story happened in the past because she's wearing a dress and a cardigan. Normally when I see my students come to school, they wear jeans and a t-shirt. And even sometimes I wear jeans and more casual clothes. But they're not dressed like that, which makes me think it happened previously. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The story of Ruby Bridges.
Okay. I'm going to show you the pictures, and then I'll go ahead and read. Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very poor, very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were many times when we didn't have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick the crops, so my daddy lost his job. And that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. I want you to think about what the word poor means. Okay, he lost his job. He doesn't have a lot of money. What does poor mean? You're right. Poor means you don't have a lot of money. Okay. When you're wealthy, you may be called rich or affluent. But when you're poor, you don't have a lot of money. So they had to move. In 1957, the family moved to New Orleans. Ruby's father became a janitor. Her mother took care of children during the day. After they were tucked in, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors in the bank. Every Sunday, the family went to church. We wanted our children to be near God's spirit, Ruby's mother said. We wanted them to start feeling close to him from the very start. So when I made my inference about when this book took place, or maybe when you've made your inference, we said that maybe it took place in the past. We know we're in what school year? You're right, we're in the school year of 2020. And it was 1957 when this story took place. At that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New Orleans. The black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children. It wasn't fair. And it was against, it wasn't against, or it was against the nation's law, which means black children and white children did not go to school together. In 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to the white elementary schools. Three of the four girls went to McDoe 19. Six-year-old Ruby Bridges was, was sent to first grade in William Franz Elementary School. I want you to think about if you were in these shoes of Ruby's shoes or one of the other little girl's shoes, how would you feel? Would you be excited, nervous, worried, anxious? And why would you feel that way? Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history. They went to church. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong, we'd all have courage, and we'd get through any trouble. And Ruby would be a good girl, and she'd hold her head up high, and be a credit to her own people, and a credit to all American people. We prayed long, and we prayed hard. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry people, of angry white people, gathered outside the Franz Elementary School. The people carried signs that said they didn't want black children in a white school. People called Ruby's names. Some wanted to hurt her. The city and state police did not help Ruby. The President of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. The marshals carried guns. Now we're going to make an inference right now, and I want you to think about why the marshals were there to walk Ruby into school. You're right, they were there to protect her. So we took the word marshal, which I'm sure you didn't know what that, meant, that word meant, and we knew that they carried guns and that the president ordered them to be there. So we used our background knowledge to think about why somebody would have a gun why somebody would be named a marshal or why the president would be involved. It would obviously be because it would be a very important thing. And Ruby's a little girl and all of these people are yelling at her. Okay. So we just made an inference and that they're there to protect her. Let me go ahead and show you this picture. 
Every day for weeks that turned into months, Ruby experienced the kind of school day. She walked to Fran's school surrounded by marshals, wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair, carrying her lunch pail. Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks. As Ruby approached the school, she saw a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed toward her. The marshals kept them from Ruby by threatening to arrest them. Ruby would hurry into the crowd, or hurry through the crowd, and not say a word. I want you to think about why Ruby didn't say anything. You're right, because she probably didn't want to start a fight, and she probably didn't understand why they were yelling at her in the first place. You have to remember, she's just in first grade, and she's just there to learn. Let's continue. Before we continue, I want you to make an inference now, and I want you to ask yourself, why do you think all of the desks are empty except for Ruby's? What's going on in our story right now to make you think why nobody would be in school with her? You're right. She's the first black student to come to the all-white school, so maybe the white families don't want her to be there. Let's find out. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Mrs. Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company, to play with, to learn with, to eat with. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to business of learning. She was polite. She worked well at her desk, Mrs. Henry would say. She enjoyed her time there. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, in an empty building. Now, knowing that the school was not filled with other employees and there weren't students in the building, what do you think Mrs. Henry believed if she's showing up every day to teach Ruby? You're right. She's there because she supports this belief system that black children and white children should go to school together and that she should be Ruby's teacher and she should help her learn to read and write. Let's continue reading. Sometimes I'd look at her and wonder how she did it, said Mrs. Henry, how she went by those mobs and sat here all by herself and yet seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on going so relaxed and hopeful or if she would gradually begin to wear down or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. Why do you think Ruby wouldn't want to go to school? You're right. She probably wanted to go to school so she could make friends and she could learn with her friends, and right now she has no other classmates. Now we're going to think of a critical question, and I want you to think how you would feel if you were in Ruby's position. Would you want to go to school, or would you want to stay home and be with your family? Let's continue reading. Then one morning, something happened. Mrs. Henry stood by a window in her classroom as she usually did, watching Ruby walk toward the school. Suddenly, Ruby stopped, right in front of the mob of howling and screaming people. She stood there facing all those men and women. She seemed to be talking to them. What do you think she could be saying? What have we learned in the story so far? Let's go ahead and find out. Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into the school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and walked into the school. When she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked her what had happened. 
Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mall. Ruby became irritated. I didn't stop to talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, Mrs. Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. This reminds me of in class when George and other students are talking and they're like, Mrs. Taylor, I wasn't talking. And what do I say? Your lips were moving. Let's find out what Ruby was doing. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. This morning, she forgot until she was already in the middle of the angry mob. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walked a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeated twice a day, before and after school. Please, God, try to forgive those people, because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're doing. So you could forgive them, just like you did those folks a long time ago, when they said terrible things about you. Afterward. Later that year, two white boys joined Ruby at Fran's elementary school. Their parents were tired of seeing the boys get into mischief around the house when they could have been in school and learning. The mob became very angry when the first white students went back to school, but those boys were soon joined by other children. Excuse me. We've been sitting back and letting our children get cheated out of an education because some people have tried to take the law into their own hands. One parent said, it's time for us to fight for the side of the law and for our children's right to go to school and get their education. They all did get their education. Ruby had a growing number of boys and girls who went to school with her. By the time Ruby was in second grade, the mobs had given up their struggle to scare Ruby and defeat the federal judges. Order that the New Orleans school be desegregated so that children of all races might be in the same classroom. Year after year, Ruby went to Fran's elementary school. She graduated from it, and then went to graduate from high school. Ruby Bridges is married to a building contractor. A contractor is somebody who works on houses or buildings and repairs them or builds them. And she has four sons. Now a successful businesswoman, she has created the Ruby Bridges Educational Foundation. With it, focuses on education, community, and the future of our nation's children. The foundation is especially dedicated to revitalizing the Will William Franz School, which is located in the heart of the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Ruby is once again stepping to the forefront and embracing an opportunity to make history by contributing to the challenge that our nation is facing in the recovery efforts from the following Hurricane Katrina. There is also a special exhibit featuring Ruby's story at the Children's Museum in Indianapolis, Indianapolis, Indiana, called The Power of Children, Making a Difference. So I want you to think about how I read the lines when one of the characters was speaking. I didn't use my normal voice. I did something like this. And I want you to ask yourself, why did I speak like that? Where did our story take place? You're right. It took place in New Orleans. And New Orleans is in the southern part of America. And so Southern people tend to have an accent. So in order to build an image for you as I read this story, I read it with an accent. We just made another inference, okay? Now we're gonna end today with a critical thinking question. And I want you to think about how you can make a difference in this world. How can you make a positive difference so that our world is a better place? I want you to go ahead and write your answer down and be ready to share in groups tomorrow. Have a great day, boys and girls.